expert insight, clear analysis, strategy in action. Welcome to the CEO to CEO podcast, featuring the world's top CEOs. The podcast will welcome honest conversations meant to challenge traditional ways of thinking from fellow global industry leaders. This podcast will also explore the intricate world of M&A from an insider's perspective. M&A is a big deal, one in which you can drive the future of your business, your industry, and even the trajectory of the marketplace. This podcast is hosted by Kevin Campbell, CEO of Synity. Synity is a global enterprise data solution provider specializing in data operations and data transformation. Kevin is a global champion in data and has served as the former Group Chief Executive Officer at Accenture and COO of Oscar Insurance Corporation. This week, Kevin Campbell sits down with Bill Green, former CEO and chairman of Accenture. During his tenure as CEO, Accenture grew revenue from approximately 14 billion to approximately 22 billion, doubled its workforce to 211,000 employees and expanded its global footprint. Today, Bill is a member of the Global Advisory Council of Bridge Growth Partners and holds noteworthy board roles at major companies such as Dell EMC and SMP Global. Welcome to this week's CEO to CEO podcast. And this week I am uh, delighted to have on uh, my, uh, my friend and longtime mentor, uh, Bill Green. Uh, Bill uh, was at Accenture for uh, a long, uh, illustrious career, grew through uh, a variety of different positions, ultimately rising to uh, CEO and chairman. Uh, where he was for some 33 years. And then uh, since that time, uh, Bill's been on a variety of boards. He's been the lead director at EMC uh, during the uh, acquisition by Dell. And uh, today he spends a lot of time uh, helping other people, uh, both for nonprofits and for theirs. So Bill, welcome to CEO to CEO. Thank you, Kevin. I'm delighted to be here. Maybe you uh, could start out by, you know, most people know us, know about you as the chairman from, uh, from Accenture. Uh, you're the face of Accenture wherever you go. Um, can you bring us up to speed kind of what you've been doing since then? You know, I knew I was going to fail graduation and I did. That was in 2013. Um, and so then you immediately, you know, I, you like to stay in the flow, right? You like to make a difference and you like, especially being with all the people that you used to be with. So, you know, I have uh, some public and private boards, Dell, um, of course, uh, Standard and Poor's, which has, you know, been fun because there's been some drama, some acquisitions, some divestitures and stuff like that. Lawsuits, you know, all kind of juicy stuff for like board types to pay attention to. And uh, Anovalon, which is a healthcare startup that I actually looked at buying when I was at Accenture. Um, and I remember when he left the room, uh, Pam Craig, who you know, our CFO said, what did you think? And I said, too good to be true. Well, it, you know, it actually was true. And uh, so it's a great little company now. And then uh, GTY, I have one of these SPACs. People hear about SPACs now because everybody's talking about them. Uh, back when we did ours, which was three, four years ago. Um, well, let's just say, you know, we learned the hard way because we were new entrants and we were the first out of the shoot. Uh, but it's been fun because at the end of the day, um, it, you know, you get to the end of the ride, you say, what do I really like doing, right? And, um, you know, I like building businesses. And so some of that can be in a small business, but also as businesses get bigger, there's still a collection of small businesses that kind of fly in formation. And so, um, you know, that's been fun for me. And, um, and, and the private company thing has been fun for me because, you know, you just, you just, you, you remember back when those public companies uh, became public, then they wish they were private again, right? So you go around and around. Uh, but in the end, right, you still get a chance to do exciting work and work with great people and have a little fun along the way. Yeah. And you also got some pro not for profits that you have that you spend some time with relative to education. You want to tell yeah, us? Yeah, I've always, I've always been uh, grateful for 
Um, I won't tell you my ranking in my high school class, but let's just say um, I was saved by a junior college at the time. And uh, I, I also learned a lesson there, right? And because, uh, you know, the job of the college, you know, I thought was to educate, but its real, real job was to energize and inspire. And I always say, and I've taken that to, to my work um, uh, way of thinking about things is, you know, there's just educate, energize, and inspire. Energizing and inspiring people unleashes real power. And so I was one of those kids that had lost his way. And then I got inspired at the school. And so I still do work with the community college system in the U.S. and uh, the college dean college, which I went to. Uh, and I've been on the national board of Year Up um, for a long time, which works with sort of, you know, inner city for the mostly uh, young people, what we call opportunity youth, and essentially gives them training, almost like we, you know, nine months of boot camp kind of thing. It, it gives them some community college training. It gets them an internship uh, at a big company. And about 78% is the statistic right now if those people get full-time jobs. And uh, so I've been, I've been delighted with the progress uh, with that. And, and recently, of course, with um, some of the social unrest in the United States, um, we've gotten a lot of demand as people try to get better balance with inclusiveness and diversity within companies and then find out, you know, where are these where are these pipelines of entry level talent uh, that are from a diverse people and diverse background uh, that we can get into our workforce. And so I've been spending a lot of time on that as well. So important. Right. Because, you yeah. know, I, I might have stolen the line from you, but I always say, you know, the people with the best team wins. Right. Yeah. And getting that talent from wherever it comes from is critical. Well, and you just find, I mean, it's, you know, in every organization, there's trapped talent. Right. Um, you know, and our job is to sort of find it. And uh, but you realize that in society. Right. There's just there's just really millions of people that can make bigger contributions than they've been able to find their way to, for an opportunity to do so. And so we have uh, we have served 30,000 young people so far, uh, wow. but we're trying to get to a place where we can serve 100,000 people a year. Right. Which is that's the kind of the kind of need there is out there right. to just get talented people, the right kind of training and get them in places where they can take responsibility and take charge. So, you know, that's good fun. Well, with all that, you're keeping yourself pretty busy. How do you? still have trouble at time for some sailing uh, or motorboating and the grand. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, um, I, you know, it's, you know, when I ran Accenture, at least I created my own schedule right now, all those other entities create my schedule, but, um, and, and I'm, I, I used to say to people, you know, I don't want to have to apologize for the fact that I like to work because because I just do like to work. Right. Um, but um, my grandkids are down on the Cape, two of them. And other than this COVID thing, uh, one of them goes to school. So I'm always looking at him, like making sure I, with a stick, he's like six <laughs> feet away. But I, uh, you know, I'm a lucky guy, right? I got my, my kids are around and active and uh, the two grandkids and um, I get the toys out, right? And uh, we were just chatting earlier about, it's in the 30s here and going to rain on the Cape, but pretty soon it's going to be sunny and uh, the fish are going to be back. So, um, you know, my time is coming. That's that, that's right. Hey, let's switch and talk a little bit about M&A. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been involved uh, uh, with a lot of M&A, both at Accenture and then the mega mega deal at, at Dell and EMC. And then, as you mentioned, on some of your other boards from there, what advice do you have for CEOs? Um, as they think about m and I guess my first thing is always never lose the ability to grow organically, right? So I sort of start there because when you start having to buy the revenue rather than create the revenue from your own work, you know, I think in some ways, you know, you lost the plot and, you know, we can think of 
companies we used to compete against when we were young guys out there banging away that you know lost the ability to grow organically and the, and it was kind of the beginning of the end now it can take years but like you lose the plot that being said um, the way change is coming so fast the ability to accelerate you know it towards the direction you think you need to be strategically um, you know, M and A is a is is a great tool. Certainly, the EMC uh, Dell. Um, you know, it was easy to sort of get the original agreement, and then it takes you a year and a half to close the transaction because there's you know these things are a lot of work. Right? Uh, the bigger they are, they're the more complicated they are. You still have to do all the pieces, but maybe not as much at scale. But the other thing is, you know, how do you take you know, the best of each organization, you know, as I, you know, I just went through one with uh, Standard and Poor's, um, we won't close for nine months, probably, but going through the going through the work. Um, and, and right now we're in that spot where you say, you know, what are the really interesting things that they figured out, right? And how do we learn those? And then how do we also bring in, you know, some other people as part of our management team, which is now extended and, you know, let them lean over and grab the wheel of the bus and turn it a little bit, right? How do, you know, how do we make sure we're listening and learn? And, uh, and I think, you know, with all these, there's cost synergies and revenue synergies and the costs are easy to get, um, but they don't give you the lift that the revenue synergies do. So, I'm kind of a revenue synergy guy. I mean, that's that's kind of where I go because that's the chance to surge ahead in the market. And and it's one of those things you want to look back on, you know, three years out and say, that was a really smart thing we did. If you do it well, right, hopefully you find some nuggets in the combination that neither one of you would have had separately. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And, and nuggets is the right choice of words, right? Um, and especially, you know, consistent with, you know, the business that you guys are all about and we're all about is, you know, the data business, because, you know, in those data businesses are tons of gold nuggets and, and more and more companies are essentially, you know, managing big data sets, interrogating them for nuggets and then selling nuggets on the outside to the market and, uh, it, you know, and that's a nice business and it's a subscription business. It's a sustainable business. And, you know, interestingly, even even the hardware companies are, are you know, this last year have been moving to subscription, you know, as a service kind of models. Right. So it, it, the ability to be able to accelerate that quickly, um, you know, the M&A stuff is a good is a good tool. And, you know, for the most part, they have great outcomes. You mentioned data, right? And uh, you know, you as you've looked at all these transactions, right? Um, and you talk about what we can do with data and how we can go through it. But what what generally uh, any advice on the role of data in a transaction? Well, I guess that you know, there's a couple of things that are that's interesting. One is I think as as we know that you know M and A creates opportunity for new entrants to help the company, right? So, um, you know, there's nothing better than an M&A transaction to catalyze a company to do something that it knows it should have been doing in the past and, and can get now get to it, right? And, yep. you know, it doesn't matter kind of how you handle the accounting for it, but it's the chance to sort, sort of surge ahead. And then, you know, on, these, on this M&A stuff, it, it comes down to the data and the people. And people go into the transaction because they want to get into a certain market or, you know, it'll be an accretive acquisition or something like that. But in the end, right, it comes back to the talent, right, and how you get the talent to merge uh, and operate seamlessly. And then and then the, in the data are the nuggets of gold, right, that, you know, you sort of dig around and find. They could be point solutions that you develop for somebody that you then see that you can reuse. Um, but, you know, there's just lots of things in there, you know, which, which if you do the work, you know, you get, you get the result, right? It, it doesn't come without the hard work, but if you do it, 
um, you know, it yields, right? And it, and it makes you a better company and it provides, you know, opportunity for people to learn and grow. This podcast, we've scheduled the air on Thank Your Mentor Day. Yeah. So first, I want to thank you for being my mentor uh, over the, for over and friend for over 30 years. Uh, invaluable for me and uh, a lot of what I've been able to. Fun uh, for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, as uh, you know, as we've talked about before, the role of the mentor, right, um, is to coach, to listen, to provide experience to provide some tough love um, uh, along the way. And, uh, and I'm not the only one that's benefited from your mentoring. So uh, that, that line is long. So uh, some of them told me to say thanks on, on behalf of your mentees. Um, the, uh, who have been your mentors over the years? You know, I, I was thinking about that. I mean, the first thing is uh, I've always studied the people I work with, right? And, you know, in, in, in even in a mentoring relationship, it, that's not a one-way transaction, right? I mean, it's right. just, like, whether, whether you call it mentoring or, or whatever, right? But it's the opportunity to sort of listen, learn, and synthesize things you see from people. And, um, you know, you learn, you know, talking about nuggets, you know, you just get people that, that all... You could spend, you know, hours and hours with them, but it could be one sentence, right, that defines you. Like, you know, you and I had a chance to work for Dick Boyle, right, who just recently passed away. And, you know, Dick Dick used to say, the harder you work, the luckier you get, right? I mean, that's all I need to, you know, and, and I just heard that. And, you know, we had little acrylic things made with that on there, but it, it, like it never leaves me, right? It's just like it just lives with you. Um, <clears throat> I worked for this guy, Bill Stoddard, who was a hard guy to work for at Accenture. And people used to call me and say, you know, how did you work for that guy, right? He's like tough as nails, you know, and he was, right? He was sort of tough, you know, had the German thing going on and everything else. Um, but what did Stoddard teach me? You don't shit where you eat, right? I mean, like, how valuable is that? And so just these little nuggets, um, because, you know, those are the nuggets you take away, but you just watch and you see how people think their way through things. And, and, and that's why mentoring is just a two-way relationship, right? It just like trade notes. I use the term noodle. I'm not sure it's a real word or not, but I use the term noodling on stuff. Right. And, you know, you know, back at Accenture, we always used to say, um, check in, right? Just check in. And those check-ins, right, are, you know, more, more than not, you know, kind of mentoring sessions, just checking your thinking, right? No agenda, uh, nobody wins and loses. It's just like, let's just process this a little bit and see if we can't come out with a, with a better answer collectively or a better way forward than you would have by yourself. Yeah, uh, so Dick and uh, Dick Boyle and Bill Stoddard, those are two names that uh, bring back a lot of memories. And as you said, those couple of things that they say, and, and you know, and both of them had positive outlooks on life, right? Yeah, oh, yeah. No yeah. matter what was happening, there was going to be an answer, and they were going to get it done. Yeah, I mean, I remember <clears throat> I was thinking about Dick the other day, just because. He was a partner's partner, as we, we call it, right? Um, you know, a great human being and a great professional, right? Um, and, he, and he didn't have to be that deep content-wise because he just had the human touch. But I remember five years into the firm, I was a young manager. And uh, I went to Dick. And I had a job offer from outside of Accenture. And I was going to get a car and I was going to make more money. And I, I wasn't, I was traveling all the time then. And I was going to like, was a local an in town assignment, as we used to say in consulting. Yeah. And, and I went into Dick and I said, Dick, you know, I just, I got this opportunity. I got this job offer. Here's what it is. I told him the whole story. And he looked at me and he said, you know what you have here. You'll make the right decision. But, you know, when you go in there, you think 
people are gonna you're gonna say, will he offer me more money, or is he gonna like at least beg me to stay, or right. say, hey, we like your work, you know, what will it take? Yeah, yeah. You know, he didn't say any of that. He said, you know what you have here, you'll make the right decision, and that was all he said. And I I left his office, uh, but it was maybe the most profound thing because. I thought about what did that man mean? And I thought about, I work as part of a great team. I do exciting and challenging work. I can trust the people that I work with. They have my back all the time. If I have an issue, they'll surround me to help me, right? And, and, yeah. and I, I thought my way through it. And, and over my career, just too many people, it's easy to think what you don't have instead right. of what you do have. And, and so, and after that, I never looked for a job outside the firm. It was just, I just kept reminding myself, God, I do exciting and challenging work. I work with really smart and talented people. We're doing good stuff. Our customers love us. We're still a lot of, you know, runway left to make this a bigger, more successful business. You know, why would I want to go do something else? And then as you know, right, the people think, um, is power, right? I mean, the people that, you know, you give your lives for each other, right? That's, and, and you know, that stuff, you, you, you can't find that out there in the big world. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. I think too, people, too often people uh, don't recognize it when they have it. And then yeah. when they don't have it anymore, they say, yeah, I want yeah. to get back to that. And, I, and so, you know, here's a guy who, and so if you think about that, he let me come to the conclusion, right? He didn't right. tell me what I had. Right. He let me think about it, right? And, you know, that those are the kind of healthy things that you really benefit from. So with all the demands on your time, how do you, how do you figure out, you know, how much you can do for, uh, how much time you can spend talking to people? I mean, I've never seen you say no. So how do you do that? How do you sort through that? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it was, it was more complex at the beginning, um, when I had first retired. But then you kind of just say, like, what do I need in my world, right? Enough to, you know, what's the intellectual stimulation? What's the physical stimulation? What are the things I just have passion for? And yet, you know, I, uh, some of the things that, well, I always wanted to be like, Eric Clapton or Jimi Hendrix or somebody, right? A guitar guy, right? And but I then I joined Accenture, and I have sixty guitars, but I can't play them any better than I could play them back when I joined Accenture. And so you know, I love the guitar thing, but it has you know a small spot, right? <laughs> you know, in in the brain, and uh, it hasn't had a big enough spot in order for me to get any better. <clears throat> but I. You know, you sort of you move from you know like profit to passion, and you and you move from you know money to meaning and things. You know, some things that you know I sort of have figured out. Um, you know what makes me go right, <clears throat> and um, and then this you know give back thing I think is a big deal. It's an important deal, and and you know more importantly, there's a lot of ways to do it right. Doesn't yeah. have to be about money. It can just be about looking after a couple of young people that you know, right? right. Um, and 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 I get great pleasure from it, and I think it keeps me relevant. And and the questions from the young people keep you keep you sharp, right? Yeah. Um, you know, every once in a while, you remind yourself that you know they weren't born when I started at Accenture, but <laughs> but that's okay, right? I, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we're we're fast friends anyway. So. Yeah, no, uh, that's awesome. And I, I think your points on, you know, meaning, um, and it's really about the journey and the people we meet along the way and the conversations you have along the way that make it, uh, it make it really special. Yeah, I mean, I look back and, you know, I, 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 I get this a lot now, and, and I get it when people are going to leave a big company and then decide what to do right right and especially if they're going to work with a smaller company or something and you know i like gty this company that joe tucci and i started um i just want to look back with pride and say did some good stuff 
met some great young people, uh, you know, gave them my best advice and they took it and to somewhere I couldn't have even fathomed, right? right. You know, and it kind of gets back to, uh, it, it gets back to, you know, some of the early core values um, that you learn in the work. I mean, you you learn the you learn the words of some of these values, but you don't learn what they really mean until you spend time in the work environment, right? right. Um, and, and and then and then you start to get an appreciation for it and and at the end of the day um i remember when i uh when i uh told a, one of my clients i was going to be the chairman of accenture not this you know i was going to step down as ceo just be the chairman and he said to me you don't want to be there for that part <laughs> and i you know i thought it was like and this was Ben Vervain who ran Alcatel at the time. He was at British Telecom before you probably know the name. Yeah. Um, he's a Dutchman, right? So he just serves it up to you, right? That's and great. then uh, and then when I left Accenture, so even uh, he's I said, he said, What are you gonna do? I said, Oh, maybe I'll do another gig, Ben. And and he said, Bill, you got nothing left to prove and nobody left to prove it to. <laughs> you know, so it's just like, you know, but think about that, right? Yeah. That, it was just being out in the flow, right? Chatting with people. And and those words, right, were profound, right? Yeah. Like, like Bill, you know, you 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 ran the big company thing, you know, tick, you know, you got plenty of runway and you got lots of stuff that you can do. And and you know, it's those things that you know help you see your way through the backstretch, I think. Yeah, I think that's awesome. The last question I always like to ask people is what's the best career advice you've ever gotten? Well, I, you know, I think I'd go back to the Dick story, you know, just um, you know, what, him saying, you know, what you have here. Um, you know, and I, you know, it was sort of like when we used to, you know, in the late 70s and the 80s, when people, people wanted to move their factories to the south, you know, you'd say, well, shouldn't you figure out how good you could get it here in Connecticut before you move it down there, right? Right. And so I, I, I think you know the best advice is you know just sort of taking stock and um, you know I always said at Accenture right the, the the line between being criticized and being challenged is really thin, yeah. but but you know for good people right in your company and Accenture. Um, you know, criticism causes people to go on defensive. Challenge causes people to raise their game. And so just how you communicate, right? How you say things, um, you know, if you take that and then having a, you know, having a sense for what you do have where you work, right? Those, the, the relationships, right? The stuff you learn, right? The, the fact that it's safe, the fact that it's okay to, say you don't know how to do something and ask for help you know those sort of things you know in the world today are really precious and so to me i i, I always when you know lots of people when they're going to graduate from accenture check in with me and you know we always start there right right um you know what's the stuff that you have right that right. really works for you and um and then you know i for my whole work life, I've had fun every day. And, uh, you know, and even in the recessions and the downturns and the lawsuits and the write-offs at the National Health Service in the UK, right? I mean, I can think of all these things that really tested me. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I look back and I had fun every day and I had pride that we did good stuff. And then the people that I tried to help along the way have outperformed my wildest expectation for what was possible. And, and that's just the human condition, right? That's picking people and investing in them and then letting them run and getting out of the way, you know, set the guardrails, but as long as they're heading in the right direction, there's a lot of ways to get there. And let them run. Well, Bill, thanks for being on uh, the podcast and uh, thanks for everything you uh, you do for me and for Sinity. It's uh, 
very much appreciated. And you may. Yeah, no, I, I'm uh, I'm delighted with what's happened to the. I mean, it's just total transformation. You know, we talk about transformation. You know, small T all the time, but synergy is big T transformation, and and it has that secret sauce thing, right? Which is, you know, you and I came from a place that had special sauce, and. You know, I feel that in synergy every time I talk to anybody up or down. And and that's power, right? Because we used to say our competitors can copy everything we do, but they cannot copy our secret sauce. And I think you guys have that too. And that's just raw power. And that means, as you always say, the best is yet to come. Thanks, Bill. All and right. My th pleasure. Th thanks, audience, for tuning in. And uh, Tune into their next episode uh, in a couple of weeks on uh, on CEO to CEO. Everybody have a great day. Thank you for joining the CEO to CEO podcast. Join us next time as we uncover data strategies to support mergers, acquisitions, divestitures with the world's top CEOs.